Albert Fish, American Serial Killer. Let's fucking do it. This was recommended to us by Tesla. Hamilton Howard Albert. How the fuck does he come up with Albert? Was an American serial killer, rapist, child molester, and cannibal who committed at least three child murders. What does that mean? Murder as a child or murdered child? Pedicide. Okay. He killed kids. He was also known as the Gray Man, the Werewolf of Wisteria, the Brooklyn Vampire, the Moon Maniac, and the Boogeyman. This guy has got some gas behind him. Holy shit. Fish was a suspect in at least 10 murders during his lifetime, although he only confessed to three murders that police were able to trace to a known homicide. He also confessed to stabbing at least two other people. Fish once boasted that he had children in every state and at one time stated his number of victims was about 100. However, it is not known whether he was referring to rapes or cannibalizations. Okay, nor is it known if the statement was truthful. Albert Fish was born Hamilton Howard Fish in Washington, D.C. in 1870 to Randall Fish, 19, okay, okay, that's his mom, and Ellen Francis Howell. Fish's father was American of English ancestry. What up, my people? Father was 43 years older than his mother? What? This guy was pulling in the sniz at the age of 75, banging out 40 year olds. This man, this man had some fucking game and he's probably swinging a hammer. This guy's gotta be the most charming guy on the fucking planet to be 75 and just dicking down 40 year olds. Well, that's the other thing too, is like, let's be real. He's eating the competition. He's not just like fucking, you know, going out to a bar. He's probably like going out to a bar and then being like, that guy got the bitch I wanted last week. And he's eating him, taking him off the fucking board. And there's just him running through broads. Fish's family had a history of mental illness. His uncle had mania, like WrestleMania? What is mania? Also known as manic syndrome is a mental and behavioral disorder defined as a, uh, as a state of abnormally elevated arousal of, well, there we fucking go. A state of heightened overall activation and enhanced uh, effective expression together with lability of effect, like libido, is that what we're talking about? So this guy was rock hard. Murdering people and fucking broads. Maybe he was eating the dicks and he was full of tea. That's actually, maybe, dude. Maybe he was cutting balls off and dicks off and just fucking just cranked on tea. Maybe he was jacked as fuck, dude. Just like tons of testosterone and dick in his system and he was just fucking roid raging all the time. That's a possibility. One of his brothers was confined in a state mental hospital. A paternal half-brother suffered from schizophrenia. So this whole family was just fucked up. At least the family that we were looking at that was like all inbred and stuff, they kind of just had one thing going on. But this family has like everything going on. Three other relatives were diagnosed with mental illnesses and his mother had oral and or visual hallucinations. Oh, like oral, okay. I didn't know what oral was until I read the whole sentence, but originally when I saw that, I thought like either they were having hallucinations in their mouth, like, oh, get this dick out of my mouth and there's no dick in their mouth or like aura. They thought they could see people's power levels. Apparently I was wildly wrong on both of those things. On October 16th, 1875, Fish's father, a fertilizer manufacturer and former riverboat captain, suffered a fatal heart attack at the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station. His mother then put her son into St. John's Orphanage in Washington, where he was frequently physically abused. Rock on. However, Fish began to enjoy the physical pain brought by the beatings. He would have loved jujitsu. By 1880, Fish's mother secured a government job and was able to remove him from the orphanage. What the fuck? She put her kid on layaway? In 1882, at age 12, Fish began a relationship with a telegraph boy. The youth introduced Fish to such practices as drinking urine and eating feces. Fish began visit. Is he actually a fish? Is that what, what's happening here? He's actually a fish? Eating fucking poop and drinking piss? That's what fish do. Throughout his life, he would uh, write obscene letters to women whose names he acquired from classified ads and matrimonial agencies. By 1890, at age 20, Fish moved to New York. There he engaged in male prostitution. Ah, this man is hung, dude. There's no shot this guy doesn't have a huge fucking dick and began molesting and raping boys, mostly less than six years old. Okay. Fish's mother arranged a marriage with him. They had six kids. 
Albert, Anna, Gertrude, Eugene, John, and Henry. Dude, what's crazy is all those names sound like exactly like what my grandma would name children. Fish was arrested for grand larceny, convicted and incarcerated in Sing Sing Prison. Fish later recounted an incident in which a male lover took him to a wax museum where he was fascinated by a bisection of a human penis and subsequently became obsessed with sexual mutilation. Several years later, around 1910, Fish was working in Wilmington, Delaware, where he met a 19-year-old man named Thomas Bedden. He took Bedden to where he was staying, and the two began a sadomasochistic relationship. It is unclear whether or not the sadomasochism was consensual on Bedden's part, but his confession implied that Bedden was intellectually disabled. After 10 days, Fish took Bedden to an old farmhouse. Why is that in quotations? An old farmhouse where he tortured him over a period of two weeks. Fish eventually tied Biden up and cut off half of his penis because, you know, you don't want to take the whole thing. I shall never forget his scream or the look he gave me, Fish later recalled. He originally intended to kill Benton, cut up his body and take it home, but he feared the hot weather would draw attention. Fish poured peroxide over the wound, wrapped it in Vaseline covered uh, handkerchief, left a $10 bill, kissed Benton goodbye and left. What the fuck? First off, let's let's unwrap this series of events. He cut a guy's penis off, covered it in Vaseline and a handkerchief, left him a $10 bill, kissed him, said goodbye, and then left. You know what I get? Cutting a guy's dick off. Like there's a part of me that can grasp why someone might come to that conclusion of like, sometimes you just gotta cut a dick off. All those other things that he just did, I, I truly can't understand what made him do all those other things. That's like what, $5,000 today money. <laughs> Hold on, let's look that up. $10 value, 1910 versus 2024. $330. Yeah, I still not enough to warrant cutting someone's dick off. Like, if you're gonna cut half my dick off, I'm definitely gonna need more than that. In January 1917, Fish's wife left him for John Straub, a handyman who boarded with the Fish family. Fish was subsequently forced to raise his children as a single parent. After his arrest, Fish told the newspaper that when he, uh, when his wife left him, she took nearly every possession the family owned. Fish began to have auditory hallucinations. He once wrapped himself in a carpet, saying that he was following the instructions of John the Apostle. How the fuck did this guy make it to the age of 75? X-ray of Fish's pelvis and perineum introduced as evidence at his trial demonstrating more than two dozen self-embedded needles bro so he just kept shoving needles into his fucking hips and, and belly and penis and stuff x-ray revealed that fish had 29 needles lodged in his pelvic region he also hit himself repeatedly with a nail studded paddle and inserted wool douse with lighter fluids into his anus and set it alight. Whoa, this guy's gotta be crazy at a party. Could you imagine inviting fish over to your fucking house party and he's lighting his asshole on fire? That's the greatest spring break of all time. All right, es escalation. It gets worse, apparently. Around 1919, Fish stabbed an intellectually disabled boy in Georgetown. Now, hold on, guys. What was the intellectually disabled boy doing? Was he being an asshole? Just because he's disabled doesn't mean he's not an asshole. Let's read, let's read on. Let's give Fish the benefit of the doubt. Maybe the kid was an asshole. Uh, he chose people who were either mentally disabled or African-American as his victims. <laughs> okay. All right. There's a strong chance that he wasn't targeting assholes. Later explaining, explaining that he assumed these people would not be missed when killed. That's like real racism, you know? Fish found eight-year-old Beatrice Keel playing alone on her parents' farm on Staten Island. He offered her money to come and help him look for rhubarb. That's such a fucking 1900s thing to ask for, is it not? Hey, little girl, you wanna help me find some rhubarb? Here's a fucking hay penny for your troubles. She was about to leave the farm when her mother chased Fish away. Fish left, but returned later to the Keel's barn. We tried to sleep, but was discovered by Beatrice's father and forced to leave. During 1924, the 54-year-old Fish, suffering from psychosis, felt that God was commanding him to torture and sexually mutilate children. God? 
you say? Shortly before his abduction of Grace Bud, Fish attempted to test his implements of hell on a 10-year-old child who had been molesting named Cyril Quinn, who he had been molesting. I'm sorry. Quinn and his friend were playing box ball on a sidewalk when Fish asked him if they had eaten lunch. When they said that they had not, he invited them into his apartment for sandwiches. While the two boys were wrestling on Fish's bed, they dislodged his mattress. Underneath was a knife, a small handsaw, and a meat cleaver. They became frightened and ran out of the apartment. On May 25th, 1928, Fish saw a classified ad in the Sunday edition of the New York World that read, Young man, 18, wishes position in country. What? Wishes position in country? I don't even, what does that even mean? Edward Budd, 406 West 15th Street. On May 28, Fish, then 58 year olds old, visited the Budd family in Manhattan under the pretense of hiring Edward. Fish introduced himself as Frank Howard, a farmer from Farmingdale, New York. Is this even a real place, dude? It is. Okay, I thought he's like, oh, I'm gonna be a farmer. Where am I gonna be from? Farmingdale, fuck it. He promised to hire Bud and his friend and said he would send for them in a few days. Fish failed to show up, but he sent a telegram to the Bud family apologizing and set a later date. When Fish returned, he met Howard's younger sister, 10 year old Grace, Gracie Bud. He apparently shifted his attentions toward Grace and quickly made up a, a story about having to attend his niece's birthday party. This is the girl. They actually got the photo of her. Look at that. That's Grace. I persuaded the parents of Delia, Bridget, Flanagan, and Albert. Francis Bud Sr. to let Grace accompany him to a party that evening. Dude, this reminds me of Abducted in Plain Sight, where they just were, these people are so freaking chill with lending out their children. I, I just don't get it. Fish subsequently took Grace to an abandoned ha uh, house he had previously picked out to use for the murder of his next victim, Wisteria Cottage at 359 Mountain Road, located in an East Irvington neighborhood of Irvington, New York. It's on uh, Long Island. Oh, dude, what if Chef is Fish? Oh, plot twist. There, Fish manually strangled her to death, then decapitated and dismembered her body and ate most of the remains. Okay, he's a hungry little guy. Letter to the mother of Grace Bud. In November 1934, an anonymous letter sent to Grace's parents ultimately led to the police, uh, the police to Fish. Bud's mother was illiterate because fucking of course she is and could not read the letter herself. So she had her son read it to her. The unaltered letter reads, Oh, what a treat this is. Okay, strap in, boys. We're going to fucking read this handwritten letter from Albert Fish. <clears throat> I got to get in character. My dear Mrs. Bud, in 1894, a friend of mine shipped as a deckhand on the streamer Tacoma, Captain John Davis. They sailed from San Francisco to Hong Kong, China. On arriving there, he and two others went ashore and got drunk. When they returned, the boat was gone. At that time, there was a famine in China. Meat of any kind was $1 to $3 a pound. <laughs> Not New York enough? Okay. <clears throat> Hey, so great was the suffering among the very poor that all children under 12 were sold to the butchers to be cut up and sold for food in order to keep others from starving. A boy or girl under 14 was not safe in the street. You could go in any shop and ask for steak, chops, or stew meat. Part of the naked body of a boy or a girl would be brought out and just what you wanted cut from it. A boy or girl's behind, which is the sweetest part of the body, and sold as veal cutlets, brought the highest price. I ate your, your daughter's ass, is what I'm saying. John said it was so long he acquired a taste for human flesh. On his return to New York, he stole two boys, one seven, one eleven, took them to his home, stripped them naked, tied them in a closet, then burned everything they had on. Boston, listen, listen chef, I'm doing my best here. First, he killed the 11-year-old boy because he had the fattest ass. <laughs> and of course, the most meat on it. Every part of his body was cooked and eaten except head, bones, and guts. He was roasted in the oven. All of his ass. <laughs> Boiled, broiled, fried, stewed, corn dog, pickle, whatever the fuck you want. This boy was made into so many delicious little snacks. The little boy was next. Went the same way. At that time, I was living at 409 East 100th Street, rear, right side. He told me so often how good human flesh was, so I made up my mind to taste it. 
On Sunday, June the 7th, 1928, I called on you at 406 West 15th Street, brought you pot, cheese, strawberries. We had lunch. Grace sat in my lap and kissed me. I made up my mind to eat her. On the pretense of taking her to the party, you said yes, she could go. I took her up to the empty house in Westchester. I had already picked out. When we got there, I told her to remain outside. She picked wildflowers. I went upstairs and stripped all my clothes off. I knew if I did not, I would get her blood on them. When all was ready, I went to the window and I called her. Then I hid in the closet until she was in the room. When she saw me all naked and she began to cry and tried to run downstairs, I grabbed her and said she would tell her mama. First I stripped her naked. She did kick, bite, and scratch. I choked her to death, then cut her into small pieces so I could take my meat to my rooms, cook, and eat it. How sweet and tender her little ass was roasted in the oven. It took me nine days to eat her entire body. I did not fuck her though. I'm not a freak. I didn't fuck her, all right? I could have had I wished. She died a virgin. Scene. Jesus Christ, dude. Police investigated the letter, and although the story concerning Captain Davis and the famine in Hong Kong could not be verified, the part of the letter concerning the murder of Grace, however, was found to be accurate in its descriptions of the kidnapping and subsequent events. Although uh. it was impossible to confirm whether or not Fish had actually eaten parts of Grace's body. Fish said it never even entered his head to rape the girl. Well, he's, he's, he's not crazy, guys. He's a fucking murderer, not a rapist. Come on. But he later claimed to his attorney that while kneeling on Grace's chest and strangling her, he did have two involuntary ejaculations. Oh my god. I, I wish I had a joke to tack on to that, but I have nothing. He didn't even, dude. Do you know what he probably was doing? He probably tucked his hard dick between his legs and just fucking like did the fucking dolphin move. This is why this guy's banging out broads at the age of 75, because this guy's got a fucking huge dick, probably, and he can just fucking shoot loads like like he's a fucking machine gun. On, on February 11th, 1927, three-year-old Billy Beaton, that's a fucking rough name for a kid who's about to get murdered, right? Am I, am I, am I assuming correctly that Billy Beaton does not survive this story? Billy Beaton and his 12-year-old brother were playing in the apartment hallway in Brooklyn with four-year-old Billy Gaffney. When the 12-year-old left for his apartment, both younger boys disappeared. Beaton was found later on the roof of the apartments. When asked what happened to Gaffney, Beaton said the boogeyman took him. Gaffney's body was never recovered. Initially, serial killer Peter Kaczynowski was a sp suspect of Gaffney's murder. Then Joseph Meehan, a motorman on a Brooklyn trolley, saw a picture of Fish in a newspaper and identified him as the old man whom he saw February 11, 1927. The man had been trying to quiet a little boy sitting with him on the trolley. The boy was not wearing a jacket, was crying for his mother, and was dragged by the man on and off the trolley. Beaton's description of the boogeyman matched Fish. Detectives in Manhattan, oh wait a minute, Fish claimed the following in a letter, another fucking letter? Here we go. I brought him to the Riker Avenue dumps. There was a house that stands alone, not far from where I took him. I took the G-Boy there. The G-Boy? What kind of slang is that shit? Stripped him naked and tied his hands and feet and gagged him with a piece of dirty rag I picked up from the dump. Then burned his clothes, threw his shoes in the dump. Then I walked back and took trolley to 59th Street at 2 a.m. and walked Home from there, next day, about 2 p.m., I took tools. A good, heavy cat of nine tails. Homemade, of course. Short handle. Cut one of my belts in half. Slit these halves in six strips about eight inches long. I whipped his bear behind till the blood ran from his legs. I cut off his ears, nose, slit his mouth from ear to ear. What do we call that? A Glasgow smile. That is correct. Gouged out his eyes. He was dead then. Another one. I stuck the knife in his belly and held my mouth to his body and drank his blood. I picked up four old potato sacks and gathered a pile of stones. It's, it's the early 1900s. Of course, there's just potato sacks just fucking laying around New York City. Then I cut him up. I had a grip with me. 
I put his nose, ears, and a few slices of his belly in the grip. Then I cut him through the middle of his body, just below his belly button. Then through his legs about two inches, below his behind. I put this in my grip with a lot of paper. I cut off his head, feet, arms, hands, and the legs below the knees. This I put in a sack weighed with stones, tied the ends, and threw them into the pools of slimy water you will see all along the road going to North Beach. Water is three to four feet deep. They sank at once. I came home with my meat. I had the front of his body I liked best, his monkey and peewees, and a nice little fat behind to roast in the oven and eat. His monkey and peewees and a nice little fat behind to roast in the oven and eat. I'm assuming his monkey and peewees is his balls and penis. I made a stew out of his ears, nose, pieces of his face and belly. I put onions, carrots, turnips, celery, salt and pepper. It was good. Chef, is that the way to do it? Would you suggest those ingredients? I mean, I'm, I'm not much of a cook. It's standard mirepox. Base of most French cooking. Okay, all right, so this guy kind of knows what he's talking about then. Then I picked four onions, and when meat had roasted about a quarter hour, I poured about a pint of water over it for gravy and put in the onions. At frequent intervals, I blasted his behind with a wooden spoon so the meat would be nice and juicy in about two hours. It was nice and brown, cooked through. I never ate any roast turkey that tasted half as good as a sweet, fat little behind did. I ate every bit of the meat in about four days. His little monkey was as sweet as a nut, but his peewees, I could not chew threw them in the toilet. They found him to be sane and guilty. And the judge sentenced the defendant to death by electrocution. Should have eaten a bunch of batteries. Fish arrived at prison in March 1935 and was executed in 1936 uh, in the electric chair at Sing Sing. He entered the chamber at 11.06 p.m. and was pronounced dead three minutes later. He was buried in Sing Sing Prison Cemetery so we could go see him still. Fish is said to have helped the executioner position the electrodes on his body. His last words were reportedly, I don't even know why I'm here. According to one witness present, it took two jolts before Fish died, creating the rumor that the apparatus was short-circuited by the needles that Fish inserted into his body. So he actually never took it out. These rumors were later regarded as untrue, as Fish reportedly died in the same fashion and time frame as others in the electric chair. At a meeting with reporters after the execution, Fish's lawyer James Dempsey revealed that he was in possession of his client's final statement. This amounted to several pages of handwritten notes that Fish apparently penned in the hours just prior to his death. When pressed by the assembled journalists to reveal the document's contents, Dempsey refused, stating, I will never show it to anyone. It was the most filthy string of obscenities that I have ever read. My God, do I want to fucking read it. Archive the original. Wait, 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 wait. Ah, you fuck, dude. This is the fucking house that he did it in? That's a fucking cre- That's like Blair Witch bullshit, dude. That's wild. You're telling me, for the sake of this journalist's moral integrity, the world will never know what one of the most prolific fucking psychopaths had to say. We, we don't silence random shit. We stomach it because we need to know what was going on. We need that closure. I, dude, I really want to fucking- know what was written that's a shame man well dude what a fucking story huh that was crazy can you jump or can you soar so you gotta learn i was dumb